next speaker. Matthew, whenever you're ready. Thank you. So I'm Matthew Schultz. I'm the CEO of Oshin Biotechnologies, and uh, we build genetic medicines for longevity. And I'm going to start this with, oh, maybe I'm going to start it. Go forward. Down button. Ah, perfect. Okay. I'm going to start this with something uh, maybe uh, a little uh, provocative, and I'm going to say aging is never going to be cured with pills, and uh, not for lack of trying. And before the you know, small molecule guys find me in the, the parking lot afterwards, uh, I'm not saying that we haven't gotten considerable mileage out of uh, small molecule medicinal chemistry, or even that there haven't been great advances. A bunch of friends and colleagues here have been showing but that I don't think it's gonna get us where we want to go in the long term. That, uh, that to address aging, you need to be able to address the, the person more. And I liken you know, messing with the chemical substrate of life uh, to basically trying to debug Microsoft Word by changing the microchips in your computer. It's not that it's impossible, it's that it's fraught with unintended consequences. And one of the reasons why like, every drug you buy has a list of side effects longer than the intended effects. And so I think we need a, a better platform and we need genetic medicines. And this isn't a, a new idea in some respects that people have wanted to mess with the genome ever since they knew what the double helix looked like. And uh, as Nir pointed out yesterday, uh, you know, the super majority of new drugs are based on genetic backgrounds. But we've really been limited by the tools that are available to do this. And from a, an in vivo point of view, in vivo gene therapies, you know, it's pretty much dominated by these viral vectors, things like AAV, and, uh, and non-viral vectors like uh, lipid nanoparticles. And they each have significant limitations um, that prevent them from really being used to address something as broad as aging. In the case of the, the viral vectors, you have real limits on their payload, you can't redose them, they're expensive, of course, immunogenic. And the non-viral versions have really had issues with tolerability if you wanna go beyond the liver, um, or, or vaccines for that matter. And so we based everything that I'm gonna show you on a new kind of delivery technology. It's called a, a proteolipid vehicle. And you can think of it as basically trying to combine the best attributes of the viral and the non-viral technologies. So it's lipid based, but uh, it gains entry into the cell with uh, a fusogenic peptide instead of endocytosis. And this uh, really, I guess, to take a quick detour into lipid nanoparticles. Uh, they, they've made a, a Faustian bargain of sorts with charge chemistry, in that if they don't have any charge, they aren't toxic, but they also don't get into cells effectively. If you make them cationic, they can get endocytosed and they can escape the endosomes, but they become wildly toxic when they accumulate. And it's really this kinetic that has limited their use in clinic. And so what we basically did was remove all of the, uh, the toxic lipids that are necessary for normal LMPs to work. And now we added a, a fusogenic peptide to the surface that can fuse directly with the membrane of the cell and doesn't require endocytosis. And it's actually pretty cool how it came into existence. Uh, there is a, kind of a somewhat obscure at the time a Canadian virologist named Roy Duncan, and he was studying these uh, fusogenic orthoreoviruses that normally infect the stomachs of alligators. And he noticed something really interesting with them, that they could uh, get into cells with the fusion protein, but in, they're the only non-enveloped virus known to science that can do this. But, uh, but they weren't uh, using it to enter cells, and he couldn't really see it. And so they're actually using it to form syncytia. Right, I'm just going to show the video. But... Oh, well, no video. Ooh, now I've lost control of it. We good? All right. So it's fusing cells together there. It looks cool. Um, anyway, the, the fusogenic peptide has a couple of interesting attributes. Like I said, it's the only uh, virus of its kind that has them, but it's also really, really small. It's shown there next to the hemagglutin fusion protein from uh, influenza, and it's uh, about two orders of magnitude smaller than the, the next largest fusogenic peptide that's sufficient for membrane fusion. So it's quite unique structurally. In fact, that ectodomain there is only about 12 amino acids long. And this allows it to be effectively invisible to the immune system. It's rather lipophilic. It sits there in the surface of the nanoparticle. And when it gets close to a cell, it basically forms a complex and it begins to flip and mix the lipids of the cell with the nanoparticle. And so this bypasses the endocytotic pathway entirely. And it 
comes with some major advantages. So since you've removed all the toxic lipids, you can administer massive doses without causing toxicity. And here we're comparing uh, the PLV against a, a standard LMP, like a, a SNALP MC3 formulation. And you can see there on the left what it's doing to the livers. The, the LMP is barbecuing it. And, but all those mice were dying within 24 hours. In fact, we didn't expect this out of the gate. Uh, we thought it was a mistake. We ran it, they still all died. And, it turned out that the maximum tolerable dose of a, a lipid nanoparticle, the DNA payload, was one microgram. And uh, if you look closely at that uh, IL-6 uh, bar there, you can see that spike is more than 10,000 fold above baseline. So it's causing this massive immunogenic reaction in killing our poor mice. But if you remove those things, you, uh, you basically abrogate the toxicity pretty much in its entirety. And this also has major impacts on biodistribution. So, the first thing you'll notice there is that the liver is no longer at the top. I mean, it's down there below bone marrow. Um, the lung and the spleen begin to take up the most of it. And that's because the interaction is entirely mediated by biophysics. Like, it, it just needs to be in contact with the cell. If it doesn't have a lot of cholesterol on it, it's not being actively taken up by the liver anymore. So it still, of course, goes to it. And if you look at liver with IHC, we hit still basically every cell in the liver. It is being hit, but, uh, but it's pushed it way down. And this is important in longevity because the, the goal starting out with this was they wanted to be able to have a flat biodistribution curve and hit every cell in the body. And, you know, obviously it's a, a tall order, but that was where we were going with this. And it's one of the things that makes this particular delivery technology so important. So we're using this technology broadly to go after all these, you know, I guess previously undruggable targets, these genetic factors uh, that deal with aging. And we have a, a broad mandate for it. You can use this to do everything from, you know, make proteins to kill cells, to alter their behavior. And we've uh, kind of got our start in senolytics. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how those work because it's a good example. And I'll even show you some new data actually that we haven't shown before. But then I'll get into our pipeline a little bit more. So, for the senolytic, the goal, like I said, was to basically have all of the targeting in the realm of the payload, not the, the chemistry, not the delivery technology. We wanted to be able to hit cells ubiquitously without any real tropism, but, uh, but only kill the ones that were senescent. And so you can think of this conceptually a lot like those seminal studies done at the Buck in the Mayo Clinic, where they built the P16 transgenics. Um, in that this is a caspase under a synthetic P16 promoter, in the first version of it here. And so if you administer it IV, it goes into cells that are both healthy and senescent, but it only kills the ones that are P16 high. And this uh, I've included, we, it's actually from one of our oncology studies, but I think it it's really illustrates this thesis well. In the, the mouse there on the left, it's a Mr. Tail vein with the PLVs uh, containing DNA encoding luciferous under CMV. You can see the whole mouse lights up just like one might expect. But what's more interesting is the one on the right. So that mouse got the exact same dose, the exact same route of administration. But uh, in this case, luciferous is under control of a synthetic version of the P53 promoter. And we've implanted a tumor there inside that uh, red dashed line, you can see there. And so, all those organs got the same amount of DNA. We didn't alter the biodistribution of this at all. We altered the expression based on the transcriptional profile of the cell. So I'm gonna recap this uh, briefly. I think a lot of people in this room have seen it. We, we did this study a few years ago, but uh, it was the, the proof of concept, a lifespan study with the senolytics. And you can see there that uh, you've got our control mice. We start treating them at two years of age. There's 40 mice in this study roughly. Uh, at two years of age, we begin dosing them once a month. We either give them a PBS control, a P16 targeted senolytic, a P53 targeted senolytic, or a combination of them. And you can see the survival curves are, are quite pronounced. And what I thought was really cool about this was the, the dual one, because this was something that had never been done before. No one had a, a dual uh, suicide gene transgenic like this. There wasn't a dual P53, P16. And it really shows the synergy of this. And of course, it's been pointed out that P16 is not a perfect senescence marker, and the combinations definitely seem to work better. So what this led to was a, another study, a much larger one, where we were trying to assess the impact of frailty. Um, and the impacts of the, the senolytic when administered in a transient manner. So the, the first one, we gave them once a month until they died. This one, we uh, wait two years, we uh, adapt them to the protocol, and we start dosing them once a month for four months, and then follow them for a two-month washout period. 
And so we started assessing like all sorts of cool endpoints. And I don't have a, enough time to go through all of them, but uh, I'm going to show you a couple of highlights. And this was done in collaboration with uh, Marco Malavolta at INCRA and our, our very own uh, Marco De Maria, uh, our scientific advisor. Um, but uh, the first step was just looking at clearance of senescent cells, and it performed as you might expect. It reduced them uh, across the body, uh, most pronounced actually in the kidney. And I mentioned that because our, our first clinical application of this is in chronic kidney disease, or the acute to chronic transition. But uh, we saw a significant reduction in both clinical and physical frailty. And uh, on the left graph there, the uh, um, the lower number is better, and on the right graph, the uh, higher number is better. But uh, we saw uh, actually that they begin to converge after treatment as well. So, the, I mean, really the goal of this is to understand the kinetics of it. If you were to do these kind of hit and run approaches, how long would it take for you to realize the benefit, and how long would it take for it to go away? Uh, I will also point out that the effect was more pronounced in the females than the males. There is definitely a, a sex difference in this. The one other thing I'm going to touch on before I, I leave senolytics in the interest of time was that uh, it caused a significant reduction in the incidence of cancer upon necropsy. And so when all these mice were sacked, like I said, it wasn't a lifespan study, uh, you know, gross necropsy was performed on them and uh, we tried to like you know, figure out what was going on with it or if they of course died prematurely there, necropsy as well. But, uh, but it was a meaningful reduction in cancer. And this is something I think that's in line with other data and experience with senolytics that they seem to have a, a protective effect. And indeed we've seen this before, but it was it's pronounced here. Okay. So I'm going to leave Senolytics and, uh, and talk a bit more about our, our pipeline and what we're working on. And I mean, like I said, if you have a tool that can deliver nucleic acids anywhere in the body and is repeat dosable, you have an awful lot of uh, opportunities for, for fun here. And my hope actually is that some of this gets uh, your creative juices flowing and uh, I get lots of requests for collaborations and new targets and all that fun stuff. So definitely reach out if you've got them. But uh, in this case, we were treating mice starting at six years of age with a gene therapy that expressed folostatin. And folostatin's been played with a lot. It's got a, a bit of a clinical history. And, uh, but we were looking to see if we could treat them once and, uh, and see meaningful improvement in strength as they aged. And to put it in context, by you know, 80 years old, you've lost about 50% of your muscle mass. So it's really significant, of course, as you age. Physical strength counts for a lot. I mean, the, the moment you end up in a wheelchair, your days are numbered. And so if you can make old people strong, I think it could have meaningful impact in quality of life and actually probably duration as well. But uh, we're looking at using this in the clinic as prophylaxis for hip transplant initially, because I think it's a nice way to kind of control as opposed to going after fractures or frailty more generally. But uh, here's the result from it, or the top line at least. A single injection, we followed them a year later, and they were 50% larger and twice as strong. And what's interesting about this is it's not actually an integrating vector. So this is a durable episomal vector, and uh, in this case, it's being expressed from the liver. But uh, you can basically use this technology to make any protein that you'd like. And we did some other local administration of it where we could use contralateral controls and get a better understanding of, of how it was working in that environment. And you can see here that the injected side of it is both larger and stronger, and if you uh, look at it with a uh, histology, you can see that the myofibers themselves are larger, and this is also typical of a falstatin treatment. So the other thing we're doing is we took this tool that we were using initially to kill senescent cells and cancerous cells and targeted it against adipocytes. And this is uh, attractive, I think, uh, in the big picture for uh, metabolic disease. But, uh, but also, we like it because it has a nice path to the clinic uh, in local administration, going after lipidemas. So you can inject this into tissue, and it will cause the fat cells to die and not hurt the surrounding cells. And the goal for this longer term is actually to figure out how to target it to visceral fat selectively. That's something we're still working on. But uh, we did this uh, first proof of concept in it with human tissue explants. So someone would go in for like a, a tummy tuck type of operation and they'd take the excess skin, they'd you know, punch it with like a little cookie cutter and send it to us in some nutrient gel and uh, we could test our treatments on it. And so a single administration in this uh, killed about 20% of the fat cells. And so I think this is like something that sort of liposuction, surgically removing it, it's actually really difficult to reach. And so that was a, a fairly early version of it for us. 
in the, the broader kind of sense of these applications, there's a ton of stuff you can make. I mean, if you can make any tissue basically in the body produce any protein you want or alter its behavior. So, I mean, you can make things uh, like a secreted protein like a folostatin or a monoclonal antibody. You can, you can grow telomeres. You can, in fact, we're working on a, an HTERT therapy in companion animals, in dogs. We're trying to regrow dog telomeres. And uh, so I think you can produce a, a huge range of things with this. And so that's, that's our goal is to get as many as we can forward. And I think I'll, I'll leave you with one, one kind of a teaser, I guess, something that we're working on now. And uh, since you can hit cells wherever you'd like, uh, we started trying to make CAR T cells inside of people, in situ CAR T cell therapies. And it, what I think would be really cool about this is that it can make CAR T scalable. I mean, drop it down from hundreds of thousands of dollars a dose to a few thousand dollars a dose. The T cells, it, if you administer this IV, it hits T cells primarily in the lungs and the spleen. They will activate, they'll do their thing, and in this case, it's transient. So as the cells expand, they'll actually lose the construct and go back to being quiescent later. But uh, like I said, we built this initially proof of concept in oncology, but I think it actually has applications in uh, aging as well. I mean, you could kill dysfunctional tissues with it. You could go after fibrotic tissues with it. So I think it, it has a, a lot of potential beyond the, the initial cancer targets. And I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Matthew. That was uh, fantastic. Really uh, amazing technology. We have a uh, question here.